years ago, uh, Adam Bly called me. I was uh, City TV and Much Music at the time, and uh, said he wanted to talk to me about an idea of his. And the idea was that uh, he wanted to bring forth a magazine that would uh, do the seemingly impossible, which is to somehow reconcile science with pop culture and fashion. Well, lo and behold, a couple of years later, he manifested a magazine called uh, Seed, which has uh, achieved a very impressive, very impressive uh, distribution in all of North America. And I'm sure he's going to tell us about uh, how he proposes to conquer the rest of the world. He's done this by uh, challenging the cliché of the nerdy scientist and uh, introducing us to a bevy of young and hip and good-looking, as well as brilliant researchers of today and tomorrow. Here he is, the founder and the driving force of Seed Magazine, Adam Bly. Congratulations. <clears throat> Good morning. So it is wonderful to be back at Idea City. Um, so I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately. Um, particularly in the United States, we're seeing scientists assume positions of power unlike ever before, particularly in government. And it's quite shocking, actually, when you think about it in the context of the United States and the Bush administration. But several major agencies, NASA, FDA, NIH, HHS, DOE, and so and, and on, EPA, now have scientists at the helm of these organizations, degreed scientists. And it occurs to me, unlike lawyers, and unlike doctors, and unlike engineers, and unlike accountants who have to pass bars or pass CA exams, as we put scientists in positions of power, we would naturally assume that the organizations are going to be coming out with more scientifically rigorous information, scientifically sound information, and therefore we should trust it more. But there's nothing that gives us that guarantee that scientists, just by virtue of their PhD, are upholding degrees of ethics or moral conduct or adherence to a scientific method. And so we've been thinking quite a bit about, should there be something like a Hippocratic Oath for the scientific community? We're also seeing the misuse of science for political purpose, using terms like sound science and political discourse instead of bad science. Politicians using the framework of science to present ideas that are anything but. We're seeing a significant debate, particularly in the United States, with regards to teaching evolution in classrooms, uh, the Kansas uh, discussion that's, that's ongoing and the one coming up in Pennsylvania later this year. What happens to science, brand science, and the ability of scientists to then go on television or speak in newspapers or speak at conferences and present research from the um, soapbox of science when science is bastardized by politicians and in many cases by the religious right? What happens to the brand science? And the corollary, what happens when there's really a wolf? What happens when there is a significant issue um, that requires scientists to come on and talk and bring their level of authority to the discussion when we've bastardized that brand? I'm not sure there's a global solution to global warming. I'm not sure there's a global solution to how we're dealing with stem cells. I'm not sure that all science isn't local at the end of the day. I'm sure that the science can be done on a global level, and I'm sure that science is the quintessential success story of globalization. But I'm not so sure that there are global solutions to these big issues that are being driven by science. I was struck by the United Nations taking up the notion of cloning a few months ago um, and not really reaching any major conclusion. I'm not sure that these topics can really be addressed at a global level. I think it's interesting that mayors um, particularly in the United States, are now going against the federal government and looking at ways of combating global warming at a local level. I think the solutions in many of these cases will come from local levels. We're seeing California pass Proposition 51 and investing $3 billion in stem cell research in stark contrast to the federal government. Science is local. The big ideas are global, but it seems like the impact is becoming more and more local. Will politics prevent us from employing our scientific toolbox to fight emerging pandemics? Here's an interesting example. In Southeast Asia, abstinence only is not going to work. We need sex education. We need condoms. We need clean syringes. 
these kinds of tools, these kinds of solutions, things that we've developed over the course of the 20th century, and we've built this scientific and social toolbox, we can't employ because of politics, particularly uh, in Southeast Asia right now. Will politics prevent us from employing this toolbox? So I've recently been, been entrenched in these uh, nature documentaries. We're putting on a science film festival later on this year. And I've been watching these nature documentaries and uh, you know, I've come across these moonwalking birds and these moths that have these 12 inch um, tongues that can go suck up nectar 12 inches deep below uh, an orchid. And I've become fascinated with the, with the power of really good storytelling when it comes to biodiversity. I think it's one thing to tell people how important biodiversity is. It's another thing that maybe, and speaking as an editor, maybe it is about some better storytelling when it comes to science. What if we can present these stories about these moths, about these moonwalking birds better? I don't think we've done a tremendous job of telling great stories. And I think better storytelling might be part of the solution. This is probably the question that I'm most passionate about right now, is what's the role of journalism? in fostering this third culture, this intersection of the sciences and the humanities? What's the role of magazines in fostering a more informed, science-savvy citizenry? It's certainly something that we're trying to push forward with SEED um, and with new ventures that we're launching. So what's the role of journalism in fostering this, this more informed science culture? Um, should all newspapers have science editors? Is it time for science to land with the same degree of, of uh, weight at national newspapers that we see politics and business. So this is an interesting uh, study that just came out in the UK. So it turns out, quite uh, shockingly in fact, that when you pull a thousand teenagers in the UK, 13 to 17 I think, none of them could name any living scientists. None. Two out of a thousand um, came close. Madonna was on the list. Um, Chemical Ali was on the list. <laughs> da Vinci was on the list. Christopher Columbus was on the list. But no Richard Dawkins, no Daniel Dennett, no Steven Pinker, no Brian Greene. So there's something problematic here. Um, clearly this is something that I'm, I'm very passionate about. And we see media as a mechanism to help uh, move this discussion along and help bring scientists to the fore in our global conversation. We think it's essential. Scientists are the, the rainmakers of the 21st century, but only if we see them, and only if we hear them, and only if we know their names, can we really move that forward. Um, so if Madonna's a scientist, Brian Greene can certainly become a rock star. Thanks very much. <laughs>